welcome to The Art of Being Human. Today I'm going to start talking to you about frustration. What is it? We talk about it all the time. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I don't feel good. But what really is frustration? Because that's what I want to focus on. There are different definitions of it, but the definition I come up with most in the textbooks that I read is that it is when you are not able to reach a goal. And to me, that's not exactly what I consider to be frustration. I think frustration is anything that bothers you because you, it, it makes it impossible for you to do what you want to do. Now, you would have simple things that would frustrate you. You would have more complex things that would frustrate you. But it's enough to make you angry. It's enough to make you unsettled because something is interfering with what you want to do. Something is, is interfering with the normal flow and pattern of your life. For example, simple frustration would be when you lose your car keys. I can remember, you can get panicky when you lose your car keys because usually the keys to your car are not the only ones on your key ring, you know, the key to the apartment, the key to whatever else, to your garage or whatever is also on the same key ring. I can remember pulling into a parking place where I live and right in front of me was a whole stash of keys, a big ring of keys and a, a lot of keys on it, but there was no identification. You know, there was no name, no tag on it that would say it was apartment, say, 415 or whatever, no name, nothing. And I picked up the keys, and I says, I really want to get them back to whoever they belong to because they must be going crazy because they can't find their keys. And it would be like about 10 or 15 keys. We're not talking one or two here. There were a lot of keys. So I'm walking around, and there was a, a, a lady who I know, and I said, do you have any idea who these keys belong to? And she did. She thought she knew. And I says, well, I want to bring them up to her. And it was on one of the floors of our building. And so she knew the lady, and she knew her number, and she called her and told her that her keys had been found. So I went back in the building, and I gave her her keys, went up to her floor and gave her her keys. She was so relieved, she almost couldn't stand it because she was so angry anxious about those keys being gone because they were keys to everything. Everything she did was on that key ring. Now what I do is I divide my keys up. I have one key that's just for the car and I have one key for uh, or other keys like for example for the, for the mailbox and things like that. Then I have another set of keys for the church so that if I lose one <coughs> If I lose one, I don't lose them all. And it's important that you take care of yourself in that way. But that would be a simple frustration, not getting the fax machine to work. Now, personally, I've come to the conclusion that fax machines hate me. I think they have, uh, as soon as I walk into a place where there's a fax machine and I need to use it, everything goes wrong. But, you know, that's just a simple frustration. There are much more frust uh, important frustrations than that, although I don't want to make light of anybody, of what bothers anybody. But if you can't get into the college that you want, if you just lost your job, if you find you have to move and you don't want to, if you're losing your house and you have to to go and find another place to live, whether you didn't pay your rent or it may be some other extenuating circumstance, maybe the house has been sold, whatever. Um, those are more important and, and heavier, more complex sources of frustration. But what happens when you get frustrated? You, nerve, you become nervous, you become anxious, and, and it goes up. You can measure frustration. There is something called frustration tolerance level. You can kind of measure it, and you get more more tense and you get more nervous and you get more edgy as it goes up and up and up. And you know your frustration tolerance level changes from day to day. There are certain days when you can take a lot of frustration and it doesn't bother you much. There are other days when you're more tense and nervous anyway. You can barely take any frustration and you're on the edge. So it changes sometimes hour to hour. It changes day by day. It changes according to how you're feeling and what your health is 
like. Because if you're healthy and you feel good, you can take more frustration than if you're not feeling well and you're already feeling out of sorts and then it's one more thing. The straw that breaks the camel's back is the expression that I want to use. But frustration is when you cannot do what you want to do or you cannot find what you want to find. I've spent, five, I've spent about a week trying to find a lost watch. I still haven't found it. It's not like it's critical. I've got plenty of other watches. I have a watch collection. But at the same time, this one particular watch, I really like it and I want to find it. So even before I came to the studio this morning, I'm there looking at, could I put it here? Could I have put it there? I still haven't found the watch. Now, it's not terribly expensive. It's only about a $30 watch, but I really liked it. And I will replace it if I can't find it, but I'd rather find it. So that's just a simple frustration. It's not going to make me late for anything. It's not going to make me run around without a timepiece. You know, nothing like that. But if it was a case of I had to move out of my apartment and find another place to live on a short notice, that would be another thing. And that would be something that I would be more upset about. And that would be a complicated or complex set of frustration. So it's, it's, they can be simple and they can be uh, complex. And and frustration tolerance, a definition of frustration tolerance, is how much frustration you can take before you go over the edge. And I want to explain what I mean by going over the edge. When it gets so you just can't tolerate it anymore, because what's going to happen is you're going to, you're not going to have a nervous breakdown, because there's no such thing as a nervous breakdown, because nerves do not break down. But you may have some trouble functioning. You may go into a psychotic reaction reaction. You may go into a neurotic reaction if the frustration gets so high for so long and you just can't take it. So I want to show you this chart I have here on frustration tolerance and explain what it is. And I think it'll be easier for you to understand it just by using this chart. So here's this chart if we can kind of scan that in. Okay, frustration tolerance. It's just a simple diagram, but it makes it clear. Here's your baseline. This is zero. Supposedly, at this point, you don't have any, any frustration. And then it goes up. I have these little hatch marks. This would be your frustration tolerance. This represents as much frustration as you can take. And this is a little bit of frustration. You know, it might only go up this high and you're all right, and then that would be just one clear line. Or it may keep going. By the time you get here, you're at the top of what you can take, and you can't take any more than that. But it keeps on going. What happens? Well, here it's got a couple of notches beyond what your frustration tolerance level is. And what's going to happen is that your system is somehow going to start breaking down. And by that, I do not mean that you have a nervous breakdown. Something's going to happen with your system. You're going to start developing some problems. You're going to have trouble dealing with other people. You may have anger issues and you may start yelling at people. You may be argumentative and hard to get along with. People may at work decide that they can't tolerate you as, in terms of working with you anymore because you have no patience at all. They can't give you simple instructions or you blow up. So what's happening? Well, you can actually have some kind of a neurotic reaction to frustration if it goes on too long and it's too, and it's too hard for you to take. Or you could develop a psychotic reaction and, in a sense, just stop functioning normally and be out of reality for a while. Now, there is such a thing as a, a, a short period of a psychosis, a short reactive psychosis, in which you're not psychotic all the time, but you go in and out of it depending upon what your frustration level is. Or you could develop a physiological symptoms. We used to uh, c consider uh, the problems like uh, your health problems are based upon your your uh, emotions. We used to consider that to be um, a, a psychophysiological reaction. And in fact, that's basically what it's called. Uh, so it, 
it, it will affect you physically. It'll affect the way that you perform. It'll affect the way that you relate to other people. You may not be pleasant for a while. Then when the frustration tolerance level, the, the frustration gets down so it's below that, the high level, then you can find that you return back to normal. People get very temporary and they get very irritated and what happens to them is that people don't want to be around them. But the, the frustration tolerance level, what you can take varies day to day, sometimes hour to hour. So you just need to remember when you're getting close to that edge, things are going to start happening to you. They're going to be not so easy to deal with. You're going to have problems. You're going to say uh, have maybe some health problems to develop and it, it's just something that you have to deal with so that's frustration so how much frustration you can take uh, varies between day to day and sometimes between hour and hour so um, the amount of, of frustration that you uh, can tolerate, and I want to mention outward aggression and inward aggression here again. We talked about this last time, but I want to kind of review it. If you have so much frustration you can't handle it, you may have be outwardly aggressive. That may not be pleasant for other people to see, or you could be inwardly aggressive, in which you end up by hurting yourself. You get sick, you don't feel well, you get migraine headaches, and I don't want to say that every time a person has a health problem that it's due to the fact that they're frustrated or they somehow can't handle the emotions that they have because that's not the case. You can have people have all kinds of symptoms and it's real physical symptoms and it has nothing to do with their emotions or other people can have those same symptoms and it's due to their emotions and so it takes a clinician some a skill to be able to figure out what's going on if you get sick and and they feel that it's emotional or it's too much stress. I had one of my students once who every time she got nervous, she popped an aspirin. She carried aspirin around with her all day. I don't know how she could have taken it. I thought there would have been some problems with her stomach because aspirin is not necessarily good. If you have a lot of it in your stomach, it could be very uh, uh, corrosive almost uh, in your stomach. But I used to see her with her aspirin bottle. She was nervous and the aspirin aspirin would go in her mouth and I'd see her maybe an hour or so later she was frustrated over something in goes the aspirin she carried a bottle of aspirin with her everywhere and I had another friend of mine who used coke she says, I can do anything as long as I have Coke. Now, I lived with a family for a while, and there she was, always with a Coke bottle. I never saw her without a Coke bottle. And I don't think she was drinking anything diet. She, I mean, something would go on, and she starts drinking the Coke. If she studied, as she studied at college classes, she would be studying, and, and the Coke would go. She had Coke with her all, all the time. And I said, how can you drink so much Coke? Oh, I don't know, it seems to calm me down. And then she'd get angry about something, she'd drink some more Coke. Her kitchen was filled with Coke bottles, you know, regular Coke bottles. She wasn't drinking it from cans, it was always from bottles. And they'd be stashed up everywhere. There was always Coke on hand. It was like, like her uh, little magic pill or something. So we do tend to uh, do certain things or behave in certain ways or depend upon certain things to help calm us down. With some people it would be eating candy. For other people it would be drinking soda. For other people it's doing something else. But a lot of people get relief just from driving. Some people get relief by drawing or doing artwork. It doesn't matter. You need to release it, but you need to release it in a healthy way and not get up to the top of the level where you're going to go over over it and then you're going to have some behavior problems or you're going to get sick. So uh, it's something you need to understand what your frustration is and do something about it. So how do you deal with frustration? What is the thing you can do if you're getting overly frustrated and you don't know what to do? Well, I have a list of things here that I think might be helpful for you to think about. For one thing, there's no such thing as perfection. Do the best you can. 
there was a lady who was in a contest. Pavar it was a, a Pavarotti contest. Pavarotti was one of the greatest tenors that ever existed. He was a wonderful singer. And he had this great competition every year or so. And the best singers would sing, and if they won the contest, then they would be a part of his shows. He would take them on tour with them, and uh, they would get a chance to sing with him on stage or at a world tour. And there was a lot of, of good results if you won it. Well, this poor lady was so frustrated. She was so concerned about winning the contest. She said, Pavarotti is my future. Without Pavarotti, if I don't win, I don't have a future. I mean, I'll be all washed up. Now, to begin with, that's not true. You cannot use a one person to cause you to be successful or unsuccessful. You can't latch yourself onto a single individual and decide that your future is based upon whether that individual likes you or doesn't like you or appreciates your work or doesn't appreciate your work. Your future is not dictated by one single person. Your future is not dictated by one single thing. If something happens to you, if you have to change career direction. It doesn't mean that you're washed up. And you don't have to be perfect all the time. Of course, as human beings, we're not perfect anyway. But I'm thinking in terms of competitions. You have to win the competition or you lose the prize. You have to behave in a certain kind of way or somebody gets mad at you and you lose your job. And you get to associate your success or your failure with what, how you relate to a particular person or how you relate to a particular group of people. And don't think of it as that way. You're not going to be perfect all the time. Once in a while, you're going to make a mistake. And even if you don't make a mistake, or if you do make a mistake, that's not necessarily going to define your future. Unless it's a huge mistake in which you end up in jail, then your future will be changed by that. But you should never identify yourself as being a product of a person, a thing, a situation, something like that. Your perfection is not going to be there. You're just a human being. Now, I do solos all the time, and a lot of times I do them with my twin sister, but I do them with other people as well. And, and she'll sweat it out and say, oh, what if I make a mistake? Now, to me, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake, you know? If I'm playing a solo and I hit a wrong note, I hit a wrong note. It shouldn't be the end of the world. My future's not going to be defined by it. But too many people define their future and their worth and their value and their success on having such perfection in their work that there's no room to make a mistake, but you're going to make them relax. And when you make a mistake, you just make a mistake. Then you have to decide what goals are worth striving for and what goals you can leave behind. You have to narrow yourself down and not try to do every single thing. Decide what's worth working toward and decide which, what's worth not only worth working toward, but what ca can you live with? How can you be relaxed? Can you, can you choose a career in which you can have some fun with it? And you need to be a, to choose your goals in that way. You need to take stock of your past achievements. What will help you a lot is to realize the times that you have been successful. If you've been successful at certain times, then review that in your mind. Don't constantly think about how you're going to do something wrong and it's going to mess you up and you're, you're going to be just finished forever. If you've been successful, think about the fact that you have been successful. You still can be successful. You don't have to worry all the time about being successful. And that should not be your primary goal anyway. Is your primary goal just to be successful? Or is it the kind of person that you can become, the things that you can do to help other people? You can change the way that you orient yourself with people around you, with a job around you, so that you can do a good job, so you can be helpful, and you don't have to have that, I've got to be successful, I've got to make it, I've got to make it, because that's not going to help you. So take stock of your past achievements. Do not procrastinate. You know, when I was in college, we used to get all these papers we had to write. 
And when would I start writing the paper? Usually on the day it had been assigned. And we usually had about a month to write the paper, sometimes six weeks if it was a very long paper. I used to start working on it on the day that I got the assignment. And I used to get it done about a week or two before it was due. So everybody else is sitting up all night long trying to finish their paper in time to pass it in. And they get to the class, the paper's done, they're exhausted, they can barely stay awake. Why not work on it a little at a time and get it done and not have to worry about it so you can relax during the week or two before it's due because you know it's, it's all taken care of, you know it's all done. And that would be much better. If you don't procrastinate, if you start on a project right away, you will be much better off. Now, there's no ready-made formula for success. It doesn't exist. Uh, being, uh, it, you are looking for that. You get books on it, how to be a success and this stuff. Just, just forget about all of that. Do the best you can. Uh, and just do the, whatever you can to help yourself, but don't be driven. And you have to be faithful. You have to reflect upon what God has done for you in your life and lean on his direction. And so therefore, you'll be successful anyway. If you do what you're supposed to do, and you do it to the best if you can, to, that you can, to the best of your ability, you're going to be successful. It's not like you're striving for it. It's going to be there. There's a poem about, uh, and I don't have it here, a poem about a person who's hunting for, for peace. And peace is like a butterfly. It lands on your shoulder. But if you go out after it and you try to catch it, you may never catch it. But if you just do the best you can, it's going to circle around and land on your shoulder. And then you'll have the peace that you need. That's a little story that I read. I haven't told it to you exactly like it is. So I would suggest that when you get into, into frustration, when you're feeling like out of sorts, try to figure out what's going on, but don't worry about it all day long. If you can figure it out, fine. Then try to relax with it. Do the best you can. Don't worry about being perfect. You're not going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean you can't be a good person, and that doesn't mean that you can't really enjoy a lot of success just by doing the best you can and not going into a panic about it. So we're about out of time, so I'm going to close it here. And the next time we meet, I want to talk about defining relationships. What should you expect of other people? What should other people expect of you? How can you define your relationship so that you can continue to have good relationships with other people without putting too much pressure on them, without allowing them to put too much pressure on you? So we'll close it here, and we'll begin again next time. Please join me then.